Hello, friends and neighbors, and thank you for tuning back in on the Find the Dash podcast. As always, I'm your host, Chad Clifton. Uh, Brother Mark is not able to be with us today, but we are going to continue with our series where we met and interviewed with Brother David Trawick, our missionary to Honduras on the Roatan Island. And he is going to continue to share his testimony with us on what God has been doing on the island. Uh, We will have his contact information available on the description area of of this episode. So if you would like to reach out to him, maybe it's uh, for more information or possibly to offer support to his ministry, you will find that information there. It will be available on each one of our sites um, in the description panel. So with that being said, thank you again for tuning in and listening. And we hope you enjoy the remainder of this episode. Now, uh, you talked about your influences in the Christian school and, and things that you went to and, and stuff. But if you were able to narrow it down, um, you know, and uh, who would you say was your biggest influence, Christian influence in your life? Well, and I know that's it, difficult. It, it is difficult um, because there were some great men in my life. Yeah. My, my pastors were good men. Brother yes. David Hancock was solid. Uh, our youth pastor, his name was Brother Gerald Hood, uh, solid, dedicated, well learned, and wanted us to be. Uh, and I, I appreciate that. Um, there were men who took time mm-hmm. in my life, and that's the men that made the biggest difference. Yes, they weren't preachers, but they were men that realized, here's a young boy from a broken home. Yeah. Who needs a father influencing his life? Yes. And Brother Don Earl Harrison from the Fairland uh, Church uh, was just a, a great man who loved people, and he made sure that when he talked to you, he talked to you. Yeah. And he listened to you. But probably one of the biggest influences was my best friend's dad. Uh, his name is Dale Ennis, and he was he was there. Right. When I needed an influence. Yes. And uh, he wasn't a preacher. His dad had been a preacher, uh, was a preacher. Uh, but it, he uh, he was just good to me. You know, he gave me a job. Uh, he taught me how to be a man by his example. And I expressly, one night, I can remember not long after my dad had... Uh, left and walked out on the family uh we were in a church service and our, at our church the men prayed on the left side mm-hmm. and i went over and sat against the wall beside the altar sat against the wall and i was kind of just hunched down had had my knees up my head down at my knees and my hands over the back of my head and i was just crying i don't even really know if I was praying, but I was feeling terrible for the situation. Sure. My dad had left. My mom was sick. Uh, she had sarcoidosis. It was just a bad time in life. Uh, I was 15. A different, you know. Later on, I be- became 15, and I had to get a job, and I didn't buy tires that you know were wide tires for my. I had a 74. Ford Maverick. It was squirrely as I'll get out. And that brother was talking. I had an eight track. Oh yeah. In, in car. I mean, yeah, it was a it was a wreck. But <laughs> but I'd I'd limp it along and and I'm I'm not buying a Bose stereo for my car. Right. Paying the gas bill. Right. Uh, I'm helping with groceries. And I was just feeling bad, feeling sorry for myself, and. The thing about Dale Ennis, he wasn't a man of a lot of words, but he was solid. Yeah. And that night, he reached his arm out, sat, he was sitting beside me, and he just pulled me up right beside him. Yeah. He didn't say, it's going to be okay. You'll be all right. He didn't say that because he didn't know. I didn't know. Nobody knew it would be all right. No one knew what it would be like. He just put that arm there. Now, it made such an impact in my life. I want to tell that story everywhere. Yeah. Because there are men out there 
who like Dale Ennis, no one knows. Yeah. But they can they can make a difference yes, in somebody's life by just being there for them. Yes. And being strong for them and helpful. And uh, I really appreciate him. And I don't know if he'll hear this or not, but if he ever does, he I love him. Yes, sir. He made a big, big help in my life. That goes back to one of the things we've said uh, several times, that ministry is not just preaching. Right. You can minister to someone. It's life. Yeah. And, and you just don't your have life you live. you called to preach behind a pulpit to minister. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. And so there, there are some, we can all name some great ones that, you know, and I heard, I like heard a that. lot of the great preachers, and that yes. made an impact in my life. I, I don't want to belittle that, but I just want, I want fellas that feel like they're just regular Joes yes. to know they can make a huge impact. Yes, sir. He, now, Dale Ennis' son is a missionary in, in the Gambia. Wow. I've been where I've been, and there are others that were in that same group that he influenced and uh, that have gone across the world. And... He maybe never will travel the whole world, but through us he has. That's wonderful. That is amazing. And so uh, while you've been there, first of all, how long now have you been in Honduras? I've been in Honduras, in Rotan Island, Honduras, for 16 years. Wow. Yeah. We were seven years in San Luis Potosí, Mexico, and then three years in Savannah, Georgia. And then uh, we spent a, about a, a year or two traveling uh, Latin America. After we left Savannah, we, we could, because our family was bilingual, my wife played the piano, um, we could go into a church in any foreign Spanish-speaking country and help a missionary with a revival. Now, the difference in, in American revival and bringing someone for a, a, a revival in a foreign country is that the missionary has to work twice as hard. They have to translate everything that's being said by the mission, by the evangelist. Right. Then in the altar, when the person's praying, they have to translate that to the evangelist so they know how to pray. And so you work hard, and you're glad to have them. Right. But when our family would go in, we could go in and, and preach a revival and sing, sing a special. I could preach in Spanish. The missionary there could relax Take it easy. I could work in the altar with uninhibited. You right. know, and then, so uh, we did that uh, and then went to Rotan Island. I was asked to preach a tent revival uh, for a, a guy, an American, who had a friend there on the island, a local Honduran Caribbean black man. And uh, I loved it. And it, I really loved it. And he had heard that I'd started a youth camp in Mexico. And uh, along with Brother Craig Benner, we founded a youth camp. And that year, I was preaching two Mexican youth camps and two American youth camps, and he had never heard of youth camp. And so he asked what it was, and I explained. Well, the young people come to one location, and we have services in the morning, the night, play games and ball and Bible quiz and so on and so forth. And he said, well, could you come back and do one for us? And so the next year, my whole family went back in the early part of the year, and we planned it. And at that time, we were doing kids' crusades in the summertime, but we set a, a time, and we went back to Honduras and wow. did a youth camp, and my family said, Dad, this is it. This is where God wants us to be. And I felt sane, but the confirmation of my wife and daughters was great. Absolutely. So that's how we settled into Rotan Island, Honduras. Now, in addition to what you just said about your family giving you confirmation that that's a miracle in itself <laughs> um, but what other miracles just a few that off the top of your head that... well you know you mentioned earlier about prison ministry mm -hmm. and uh i told y'all that i feel like reaching a child at an early age yes. is important it's vital it is actually the mo of light in the darkness it's the way we work we start with kids first. Yes. So we had moved to the north shore of the island. Now, just a little geographic history. Rotan Island runs pretty well east and west. It is about 40 miles long, and it's about four and a half miles wide at its widest point. So wow. sometimes people ask me, do you live by the beach? 
Everybody, Everybody does. lives by the beach. <laughs> so um, we had moved to the North Shore yeah. and started renting a house that had was built up on posts, like you see a lot on the Gulf Coast and that sort of thing, near water. Right. And uh, we filled in the underneath with dirt, concreted it, and our first service was on Kids' Day. And uh, in, in Latin America... You know, you have Mother's Day, Father's Day. There's actually a Children's Day. Wow. And so we, we on Children's Day, had our first church service and uh, started out. Well, uh, my daughters had begun a club for girls. And they had girls ages 7 and above who would come, and they'd do different things. Well, the girls came to them. It was Christmas time coming up. The girls came to them, and they said, we want to do what Americans do. Of course, you know, they're all speaking Spanish. But uh, my girls said, what, what do Americans do? And they said, you know, they, they go around singing. Well, my girls were three and five. We moved to Mexico. They didn't know what Americans did either. And so they're like, well, what, what do you mean, what do Americans do? And they said, they walk around singing. And uh, they said, well, what do you mean they walk around singing? They, they go house to house at Christmas time, and they yeah, sing. And, Christmas and my girls said, oh, caroling. And uh, they'd never done it, but they'd heard of it. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> and the, the girl, the, the little girls in our community, our, we call it a barrio, uh, they said, we want to do that. Because they they eat cake and hot chocolate and cookies at the end. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so we, we got uh, white robes, and uh, I got a cardboard from everywhere I could find, and I cut out these angel wings. We spray painted them white, put gold tinsel around them. We made halos. And uh, they practiced... Uh, Biancinkos, you know, it's, uh, it's Spanish Christmas songs, and uh, uh, they we even taught them, uh, we even taught them, you know, I wish we wish we I wanna wish you a merry Christmas. Yeah, we taught them that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, uh, a few other, you know, Silent Night. Yeah, we learned that in Spanish, learned it in English, and and uh, one day they were having dress rehearsal. And so we put angel costumes on little girls that were not angels. And uh, <laughs> there was, they, they're singing their songs. And a boy from the, the street came in, and he whispered something to a girl. And she screamed. And she stood up. She started throwing her costume off. And the other girls around her lived in the same area. They don't have a house. They all rent a room in this little complex, this little oh, wow. place. And every family lives in one room. And they have an outhouse, and they have this little community stove they all use, and, and then they have a mud oven. And so all these girls lived in that area, and the boy had whispered something to one of them. She screams, throws off the costume. The others start throwing their costumes off and took off running, crying. And LaDonna called me down because, you know, I avoided girls' club because, you know, I raised two girls, <laughs> had a wife, all these girls. Man, I, I need a break every now and then, you know? And so... She called me down. She said, you need to go to the, the patio and find out what, what's going on. And so I went down there, and uh, one of the mothers and and a man that she lived with had been arrested for dealing crack just oh. right around the corner from where we live. And uh, that little girl's mama had been arrested for dealing crack. And so they took the man to the men's jail. They had a separate women's jail. It was way out on the east end of the island. Now, you know, I say way out. It's 40 miles yeah. But for them, you don't have car. That's a long way. You're right. It's mountainous, you know, and they have taxis and buses, but it's expensive for them. And so uh, in, in jail in Honduras, you don't get three hots in a cot. Uh, you, you get water, and that's it. If you want a pillow, you get, your family's got to bring you a pillow. If you want a mattress, they got to bring you a mattress. And there were three women in this tiny cell. We went up to see them, and uh, I talked to the jailer and letting LaDonna and I step up to the bars and talk to these three ladies. And when, when we got to the to the cell, it was a very small, very small cell, three women. In that cell was, Edis was the mother of the little girl. She's in that cell, and two other women. And I found out the other two women was a mother and her daughter. Oh, wow. And so I started sharing the gospel with them, and I asked them, I said, ma'am, when... Your little girl was little, and you were putting her hair in pigtails. Did you ever think you'd share a jail cell with her? And and they started crying. And I asked Edith, she had that little girl that came to our club, Samantha. I said, did you, did, what about Samantha? What, what's going to happen with her? And she she started crying. Yeah. Well, trying to shorten the story some. Uh, 
she got out of jail. Well, that day she prayed. I, I need to back up. That day when I, I, I gave him the gospel message, we prayed. All three prayed. But Edith, I felt it, brother. You know, you ever, I mean, like I knew she had made a connection. Yeah, breakthrough. I mean, she yeah. had got to the rock. Yeah. And so she got out of jail. And she came to church. And uh, she told me, she said, I, I'm going to come to church. And I thought, well, we'll see. And that next Sunday morning, she was there. Wow. And Thank you. Uh, underneath our house would get real dusty. And I went down, and I'd have to go every morning on Sunday, and I'd have to sweep that whole area off with a big white broom. And uh, I went down, and someone was sweeping, and it was Edith. And she said, this is my job now, Pastor. And so she started being the one to sweep wow. the church. Service in this Lord. open air area. And she came faithful. And she's she she's after folks for the Lord. Uh, a lady named Chayo was walking down the street. She hooked her arm and she pulled her into church. She said, "This is the church I've been telling you about." And I sit right there. Pastor's gonna start. Don't move. <laughs> that is <laughs> she, great. She, and so to me, she's a miracle. Yes. A crack dealer. Right. That got on the rock. Yeah. And you know what? Now we feed kids every day except Saturday. Edith is the cook. Oh. Wow. She's faithful. She loves that's the Lord. Awesome. Love so that's that. a miracle. Um, Thank and, you, Lord. And we, during pandemic, they shut the island down. No boats, no ships, no planes could come. They, they, the American government would fly in an empty plane, and they'd load it with expats, they call them, you know, retirees, or different people who had moved. I, I'm technically considered an expat because I live in a foreign country as an American. And uh, they'd load them and fly them out, and that was it. Well, I quickly realized the children that came to our church services, our kids' services, their parents work in tourism. There were no tourists anymore. There were no tours. There were no fishing trips. All, all that completely shut down. And I told LaDonna, I said, folks are going to get hungry. And so we started going around to the families of the children that came to our kids' hour and giving them groceries every two weeks, big bags, big uh, like burlap sacks full of groceries that would last two weeks if they were careful. Wow. And uh, one day, two ladies showed up, and they said, we're looking for a man whose name is Pastor David. He's a gringo. And I said, well, check it out. I'm a gringo, and my name is David. <laughs> and they said, are you a pastor? I said, yes. And uh, they said, we're hungry, and we heard you'll feed people. And so I, I went upstairs, I got some groceries and brought them to these two sisters. And they said, you know, Pastor, um, and I probably told this at y'all's church, but I don't know who might be listening sure. and didn't hear it. And if I come to your church and tell it, act like you never heard it. <laughs> but, um, they said, we got a sister and she's got kids and they're hungry. I said, hang on, I went and got more groceries. Tito and I did. And uh, I got down and they said, there's just one little man and he lives in the shack and he's hungry. I said, tell them, tell people to come Saturday. And we bought, LaDonna and I went to the grocery store. We bought 50 family sets of groceries. Got up that morning, and 150 people were outside. Our oh, my word. And uh, so we started feeding, y'all, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We would give 65 family sets of groceries to 65 different families on Monday, 65 different on wow. Wednesday, 65 more on Friday. We'd make them wait two weeks to come back. And we did that almost an entire year. I have no idea where the funding came from that. It just would be there. That was my first thought in my head. Is yeah. that that's got a lot of money. Because we live on an island. Everything's shipped there. I do need to clarify. They did allow... Uh, cargo ships to come and bring food right. and things, but their workers couldn't even get off. So, I mean, it was locked down. And the Lord provided the funding to be able to do that. And, and I was worried that our missionary support was going to drop. And by and large, it stayed steady. Right. Uh, folks were just faithful and they'd send and say, hey, feed your people. Hey, feed your people. And what I would do is I'd bring in them five at a time, five mothers or, you know, five men, and I'd give them the two sets of two sacks of groceries each, and I'd give them a five minute gospel message. I probably preached the, the, the nutshell of a gospel more that year than ever in my entire ministry. Wow. It was a great opportunity. So that to me it was a miracle how God brought that out. And then just building this church now, yes, the way the funding yes. has come in. 
uh, I told someone that when I first started the, the project, uh, LaDonna had passed away, and we we began the and she was the she was the warrior in our family. Absolutely. So I would come and raise funds, and she would dictate where it got spent. And uh, and she was you know she was a fretter, and she worried about that. And now I have to do that. <laughs> so uh, I was like, okay, well we need block. And so I'd go look at block, and you could get cheaper block, uh, or you could get good block. And so I, the first set I bought, I, I bought some block, uh, and they come unstack, they come stack it at the side, and it's crumbling. And I thought, oh no, you know. So I was trying to cut corners. Right. But as this project has gone on, God has so miraculously provided uh, at times uh, multi thousands of dollars in one single offering. Uh, I've decided that I'm not cutting corners because this isn't my church. It's God's church. Right. And obviously, I, it's not me with the money, but God's providing it. Yes. And it's just a miracle after miracle. For instance, real quick, I know I'm hoping I hope no, you're, you're fine. You're but fine. Um, I, my last trip out, not this one, but my last trip out, I flew from the island to Houston, Texas. And I'm getting on the second plane to fly from Houston uh, to, to my next location. And I got a phone call. And it's a pastor in Kentucky. And he said, hey, brother, how you doing? He said, looks like you're traveling. I said, yeah, I've come to the States to raise funds. We need to put the roof on the church. We've got all three floors done, the walls, and needed yes. the roof done. And uh, I said, so I'm, I'm going to be raising funds. He said, well, brother, so-and-so came to church tonight. And I thought, well, that's good. I, I didn't even recognize the name, you know. I knew the pastor real well. Right. But I didn't recognize the man's name. I thought, well, that's good. But why are you calling me, you know, to tell me that this random brother <laughs> came to church early? And he turned the phone and showed him to me, and I'd never seen him before. But what I didn't know was my daughter had done a service there, and uh, he had heard her presentation of the gospel uh, and the mission work. And he said he came to church early because he wrote a check, $25,000 check. I needed twenty two, twenty four thousand for the roof, and I've just landed in America to raise that amount, and it was already there. Oh wow! Thank now, you, Lord. Now that's a miracle. Yes, it is. And you talk about because it took way a huge amount of pressure off of me. Yes, sir. And I was able then to itinerate, and the Lord brought in more money, and we got the roof on, and the whole exterior structure of the church is pretty much done, and we're going to start working on the inside now. And that's exciting because I've seen the pictures and it's so pretty. I mean, I think it's a beautiful. It's place. going to be a beautiful church. I, I'm just well. First of all, we're thrilled to have church inside. Right. Where when it rains, we don't get wet. And this trip, I'm, I'm in the U.S. This trip to raise funds for bathrooms. We're gonna have indoor plumbing, y'all. Oh. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if y'all have that up there in Virginia. <laughs> Depends on where you go. Yeah. <laughs> Now, what about air conditions? Do y'all? I, I I am gonna put air conditioning in the church. Now I don't know yet if we'll be able to afford to run them <laughs> because our electric is one of the highest in the world. Uh, in America, it runs you know nine eleven cents a kilowatt hour. Ours is forty three to forty six cents. Wow. Kilowatt hour. So yeah. Uh, but they're not used to it anyway, so we can probably knock the chill or you know put a little chill in there and take the humidity out and and everybody be comfortable. Be okay. Yeah. Wow. Man, that's amazing. Now, what types of ministries do you have going on there? I, I know you mentioned the Boys and Girls Clubs. and um... Well, here's, here's a typical week. Sunday morning, we start out with Kids Hour Church for Children. Okay. And it's a children's church style teaching. We learn a new scripture every week. We get a coloring page that I make every week. Uh, we do puppets. We dress kids up in costumes, tell Bible stories with them acting it out. Um, all kinds of activities, crafts. Uh, we try to do a craft uh, uh, every so often because even the boys there love crafts because sure. it's very unusual for them to actually make things with their hands. So when they do, they love it. Uh, so that's Sunday morning. Sunday night, our church is called, in English, it's called Lighthouse of Hope. Uh, and I can't think of a better name for a church that's in a, in a barrio with two crack houses, yeah. house of prostitution, drugs, alcohol, a cantina, all that, than to call it a lighthouse of hope. Yes. And so that's Sunday night. On Tuesday night, my daughter teaches small group. That's a new phrase, y'all. <laughs> and uh, so we have small groups. And uh, what it is basically is because we don't have adult Sunday school, we do it on Tuesday. So we have adult Sunday school on Tuesday night. No children allowed to come. 
you know, little bitty babies that you know, right. probably have to be carried. But uh, as far as that goes, we try to keep it where it's just the adults. We can focus on them. They can focus on the Word and, and learn. That's and awesome. Then Wednesday night is our, uh, our whole church Bible study. And then Friday, Tabitha and Taylor each have a club. Taylor teaches the boys' club. Uh, Tabitha teaches a girls' club. It's age seven and up. And the biggest idea is to become friends with these kids yes. so they feel safe, they feel comfortable, and they can come to a place, and hopefully we can raise them up in God's house. That's wonderful. That is so wonderful. And then you still have the feeding. Yes, and kids, we, feed, yes and we have Kids Kitchen of Hope. Yes. And that is from Sunday to Friday. We give Edie's Saturday off as a cook and let her uh, take that day off. But uh, we've had... Uh, as few, I guess, maybe as you know, half dozen kids, all the way up to thirty some odd kids. Wow! And, uh, summertime, we have more, uh, and just depends. We've had drunks wander in, demand food. We tell them to sit down, eat, as long as they're behaved. <laughs> yeah. And act nice. It's all good. One one drunk came in. He got mad because one of the boys, the little boys, got more bigger plate than he does because we feed the kids first. Right. And uh, so he started being belligerent and Edis came flying out of the kitchen with a spatula <laughs> she's, she's about to whack him but uh but he, he went running so now we'll we'll let anybody come but it's kids first that's awesome i love that now uh this last question here uh well not necessarily the last question but next to last i guess what advice would you give a young person that's struggling with god's direction in their life and maybe they don't have a lot of parental support uh, what what would you say to that person? Well, first of all, don't make God's will out to be a mystical, unknown thing that takes lightning bolts and handwriting on the wall and being knocked off your donkey. Uh, don't make it such a hard thing to know. Yeah. God's will is simply pleasing the Lord. And so in that light, at least in my opinion, you know, right. pleasing the Lord. And so in that light, find something you can do that pleases God. So be faithful to the Lord. As, and you mentioned, you know, maybe don't have a lot of support at home. And I know I know that happens. Yes. Uh, so first, be, be faithful to the Lord. You know, in, in your obedience to your parents, you're being faithful to the Lord. Yeah. In your faithfulness to the Lord, you'll be obedient to your parents. And so try to, to find out what ways, what are things I can do, and in what way can I be faithful to the Lord. And then secondly, uh, and this I thought of before we got so deep into talking about studying God's Word, but be diligent in Bible study. Yes. It doesn't have to be a lot. But do something every day yes. that puts you in the Word of God. And then be disciplined in your prayer life. And again, doesn't have to be a lot. You don't have to start out as praying hide. Right. You know, you don't have to start out with calluses on your knees, and you can't. You can't start out that way. Right. You gotta start and just start and be be faithful, be diligent, be disciplined, and uh, God'll He'll He'll lead you and guide you and help you through it and, and you can become a great man of God and great young lady of God. And this, uh, this last one, if a church or individual wants to join in support of your mission work, how would they do that? How would they go about contacting you? Well, you know, some fellas collect guns mm -hmm. and some collect knives. Some ladies collect oils. I collect giving platforms. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have PayPal, Cash App, Venmo. You know, I, I've got a, I've got a lot. You got of, them all. There, there's a new one. Uh, go go send. I'm I'm looking into that one. You know, uh, Zelle. Uh, you know, wow. all kinds of stuff. Uh, but as far as U.S. Postal snail mail, um, the address is P.O. Box one six six, Ellabel, Georgia. That's E. L L A B E L L one word Ella Bell Georgia three one three zero eight folks can write a check send it to that address we have a volunteer uh, bookkeeper who receives those and deposits them once a week and then there is our website uh, our ministry is called Light in the Darkness Ministries so our website is L I T D Ministries dot com and there's links to giving on the website as well 
That's wonderful. And Brother Trawick, I want to thank you again so much for being with us. And uh, it has truly been an honor, a privilege for us. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, not just being with you and getting to visit your booth here at the, the fire conference, but getting to be with you here today. Uh, all the times past that we've got to speak and be together. Uh, you know, often it's intimidating being around uh, you know, missionaries and pr other preachers and stuff and, and trying to, to to fellowship. Sometimes it's intimidating, but I've always felt like every time from the first time I met you when I was around you, you was, I felt like you was my friend, and it's yes, it's always a good time. So yes, I thank you for that. And uh, Brother Luke, you got anything to say before we close out? It was great. I thoroughly <laughs> and thoroughly did enjoy it. Um, we appreciate we appreciate your time. Um, yes. I also want to say maybe shout out to anybody out there. We we thank you for the time to come listen to us. We know yes. that you ain't got to listen to a couple of hillbillies and, <laughs> and the guests on the podcast, but yeah. we appreciate that, that you think enough of us to come yes. listen. I'm going to give a shout out to Sister Angel Rasnick that's been uh, listening to her episodes. She was telling me again the other night how she enjoyed them. And, and so, Sister Angel, God bless you. Thank you so much for listening. And until next week, folks. Uh, let's keep on making it count. Let's live our lives daily, defining that dash. And may God bless you. We'll see you next week.